All right, so Genesis 2, and we'll be reading verses 9 to 15. And so I'd invite you to stand for the reading of God's word. Genesis 2, verses 9 to 15. And out of the ground, Yahweh God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is the Pishon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. Bdellium and onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. Yahweh God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. You can be seated as we pray. Father, we're aware uh, that in every area we want, we need your help to guide our thoughts. We need to think like you and... uh, certainly on this topic of, of how to make sense of um, how we care for your creation, how we're supposed to think about those things with, in the modern context and the different ideas and thoughts that circulate. So help your word to be what shapes our mind. And so we, we together just pause and are asking you collectively to allow your word to shape us and to correct us and refine us. To your glory, we need the help of your spirit. Amen. Here's my thesis for the morning. Climate change is a hoax perpetuated by government-funded scientists with ulterior motives. I intend to prove this from the scriptures. I'm just kidding, of course. I think most of you knew that, but maybe some of you are extremely relieved, and maybe some of you are disappointed. But I start in that playful way to illustrate the heightened profile this issue takes in Christian circles. As the culture around us has broadly embraced environmentalism with a quasi-religious zeal, this is how we can save the world, some Christians have embraced these ideals while others have pushed hard against them. And into such a situation, God's word speaks. And not surprisingly, it rises above our time-bound debates with profound and timeless truths that challenge and encourage all believers, regardless of where we place our environmental flag. As we allow the Bible to shape how we think about creation care, we begin with the work we've done in Genesis 1 and 2. Now, we've already done this week in the past few weeks, and we saw in Genesis 1, 28, that God gave man dominion over the earth to fill it and to subdue it. And we saw then that this was a A warm, nurturing, cultivating kind of dominion. Good monarchy, we said, not bad monarchy. But we saw that God created the world with hierarchy. And mankind is unequivocally at the top by God's design. And then we saw in last week's sermon exactly how this was supposed to work itself out. By God's design, part of what it means to be human is that we're charged with keeping and cultivating His creation. We saw that we were created as agents through which the beauty and goodness of God's world could flourish. And while we saw that this principle made made more than just an agricultural point, It certainly wasn't saying less than that. Our care for the earth 
is part of our task as humans. We must care for the earth well. It is our task as God designed it. And then the rest of the scriptures fill this out. So in both Exodus 23 and in Leviticus 25, and you can write those passages down and look at them later, God instructs his people to give the land an every seven-year Sabbath. In other words, you can farm and work the land for six years, but that seventh year, you let it lay fallow. He tells them that the land itself needs a break. We don't milk every bit out of it and then leave it dry and barren. And following up on that command in Leviticus 26 and 2 Chronicles 36, it's Leviticus 26, 2 Chronicles 36, God makes clear that part of the reason he'll bring judgment on Israel if she disobeys is so that the land can have a break. God will make sure that his land enjoys its Sabbaths even if it means sending his people into exile. Now these scriptures combined, I think, paint a clear picture. We're to harness the earth, we're to cultivate it, we're to maximize it, but we are not to abuse it. We don't wear it out like a rag. We understand that it belongs to God and we are stewards of it. And so we take care of what God has given us. Has anybody ever asked you to house sit? When my very responsible wife was single, she was often asked to house sit. Sometimes the houses she was asked to watch were quite nice. And when she was taking care of them, Karen got to enjoy all the benefits of these houses. The well-equipped kitchen, the hot tub, the quiet space to read and relax. But she didn't throw parties and trash the place. She was actually more careful and cautious with those homes than she was with her own. She would take great care of these homes. And that's how it should be with us and God's creation. God's great creative work which he's placed into our care. We are stewards of it. And he wants us to enjoy it. He he welcomes us to reap the benefits of this beauty he's made. But we enjoy it with a sense of sobriety. This belongs to God and we need to use it well. We need to take care of it and cultivate it in a way that pleases him. Now, the Bible doesn't spell out exactly what that looks like. And Christians will disagree. Some will feel more strongly about recycling or greenhouse gases than others. And that's okay. Because all of us stand before God and not each other. We need to have a clean conscience before God that we have done what we can to be good stewards of the earth he's entrusted to us. So in light of these comments and these scriptures, let me give the actual thesis of the sermon, which I think the Bible does drive us to. God has entrusted the keeping and cultivating of his earth to humans. And we must steward that well. God has entrusted the keeping and cultivating of his earth to humans. And we must steward that well. Now a thesis like that, as biblical as it is, was not always intuitive to me. Maybe like some of you, I grew up in a home that was dismissive of environmentalists. I'm not saying that's where my parents are now. I'm just saying that's where I grew up. 
In fact, I remember as a kid watching a, a video at school that was you know, about environmentalism in some, some capacity, and, and us kids, we had this little camcorder where we were able to make our own movies. And a few days later, I came home and made my mock video making fun of this you know, environmental video. But the Bible is always reforming us. It's always challenging us. And so for those who were or are inclined like I used to be, I hope we allow the Bible to correct us. We are stewards. And we will give an account for how we've taken care of God's earth. But does that mean that the Bible is simply parroting the prevailing winds of our culture? Is the Christian drive to creation care indistinct from the environmentalism of the broader culture? Well, not surprisingly, biblical creation care is altogether distinct from the world's version of environmentalism. And let me explain three ways that it's distinct biblically. First, biblical creation care's goal is not to save the earth, but to serve the king. Biblical creation care's goal is not to save the earth, but to serve the king. The Bible actually is pretty straightforward about the fact that creation is broken. Just in the next chapter of Genesis, we'll see how a curse was unleashed upon the whole of it. And Romans 8 describes creation as being subjected to futility and in bondage to decay. Creation is in a bad spot. Yes, as Genesis 3 tells us, that includes thorns and thistles in the ground. But as the rest of scriptures fill that out, it includes typhoons and droughts and plagues and changes in the climate. And when Christians hear these things, we ought not be alarmed or surprised. It is just as the Bible has said. Creation is harsh and unyielding. Like a wild bronco bucking under a saddle, creation bucks under the reign of sin that we have placed it under. And that's simply something that we cannot fix until Jesus returns. Creation will continue to buck and fight. But what we can do is remember what led it to this place. In the beginning, it was not smog or acid rain that ruined creation. According to the Bible, what ruined creation was Adam's unwillingness to obey the king. And that's why biblical, creation's care, biblical creation care does not make its goal to save the earth. Rather, biblical creation care makes its goal to serve the king. In, uh, in many homes, not all homes, but in many homes when mom goes away for a few days, the household descends into chaos. And believe me, as a dad who's been there, there's no way to fix it until mom gets home. Our creation is aching and moaning because God is not in his rightful place. It's because so many humans refuse to bow their knee to him. Insisting instead on the self-rule that marred creation in the first place. And when those same humans make it their goal to save the earth, they may take certain actions that are in some ways good for the environment, 
but ultimately, without getting mom back home, the chaos will continue. So when we Christians set out to serve the earth, we do so because we're serving God. We are keeping and cultivating it because God has charged us to do so. Biblical creation care's goal is not to save the earth, but to serve the king. Which leads logically, I think, to the next distinction. Biblical creation care prioritizes God's kingdom. Biblical creation care prioritizes God's kingdom. What is ultimately best for the earth is for God to be revered. What is ultimately best for the creation is for God's kingdom to come and God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. So millions of rebels against God, united in the cause of saving the environment, will never be able to succeed. Because the heart of the problem is our fallen condition. As the book of Genesis goes on to tell us, though, there is a solution to the curse. There is a way out. And it comes through God's promise and our faith in that promise. See, humans will inevitably make a mess of things. It's one of the lessons you'll read as you learn Genesis. God's like, here's my promise of hope. And people are like, yay! And then it goes bad. They make a mess of it over and over. But over and over again in Genesis, God keeps coming back. He's saying, my purposes won't be thwarted. And so it's on us as humans, we hear from Genesis, to place our faith in God and his promises. Which is why when the New Testament comes around, there's a surprising absence of commands related to the environment. It's not that suddenly caring for the earth ceases to matter. The priority we see in the New Testament is to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. So biblical creation care prioritizes God's kingdom. I want to qualify this because some use this kingdom priority as an excuse to neglect the care for the earth. But we should never use one teaching of the Bible to negate another. That's what the Pharisees would do. No, we continue to care for creation It's just that it doesn't become our religious cause. Our culture has no bigger or greater cause to serve. So they must devote themselves with religious fervor to the environment. But the Bible gives us the higher and greater story to tell. We know what our first cause is, and so our care for creation is subservient to that. Now, God has wired some Christians to be particularly concerned about the environment in such a way that you make it either your job or a pursuit in your life. I think we can all say praise the Lord for people like that. If that's you, we who are less wired that way need you to help us to be more astute in our care for God's creation. And also for such people, I think God gives you this reminder. As you work in that field, whether it's your job or or something you do in your free time, your first priority is to proclaim the good news of Jesus to your co-workers or those in your club. Jesus first. 
Your passion for the environment in some ways is simply a means to that end. Or let me try and put it a slightly different way. We are more united with our fellow believers who do not share our zeal for the environment than we are with unbelievers who share that passion. And that's what makes our environmentalism different than the world's. Because biblical creation care prioritizes God's kingdom. Which takes us to the third biblical distinction. Biblical creation care does not invert the created order. It does not invert the created order. Remember from our study in Genesis 1 that God created the world with an order, distinction, hierarchy. And the created order goes God, humans, the rest of creation. Now according to Romans 1, the common error of humans is to invert that order. We worship and serve the creation rather than the creator. And not coincidentally, that's exactly what happened when Adam sinned. You had a serpent telling man to disobey God. In other words, creation, man, God. Now, some forms of modern environmentalism explicitly make nature out to be a god. Whatever spiritual realm there is, nature is the highest and purest form of it. But less explicitly spiritual forms of environmentalism today may still fall into the same error. Pursuit of a greener planet becomes the greatest good we can pursue. Our purpose and cause is to save the planet. But our religious fervor, according to the Bible, is not to somehow save the environment. Our religious fervor is to bring the whole earth back in line with God at the helm. Only then will our earth be healthy and vibrant. Think if my wife was taking immaculate care of that house, but was saying, this house is mine, and it doesn't belong to you. It doesn't work that way. So we fight to keep God at the top. And further, we are comfortable with man being over the animals and plants. Now, we aren't over them in an abusive and harsh way. We're over them to keep and to cultivate. But we are over them as image bearers with eternal souls. We are distinct from the rest of creation. Now, one upshot of that is that our zeal to, say, free an orca should pale in comparison to, say, preserve the life of an unborn human or an aged human. Now, it doesn't mean that we ought not care about the orca, but we keep that care in its proper perspective. Now, according to the Bible, a secular world will pull hard to invert the created order and worship and serve the created rather than the creator. So we have to be aware of that. And biblical creation care will refuse such an inversion. God at the top, then humankind, then the rest of creation. I began the sermon with a a bit of a joke meant to show how divided Christians can be over an issue like this. But I think the Bible, as we see, speaks prophetically to all of us. It challenges all of us and reforms everyone's thinking. It rises above our time-bound skirmishes to speak with authority to every time and place. 
And so Christians should not have an environmentalism that mimics the world's. But Christians should have an environmentalism. God has entrusted the keeping and cultivating of this earth to humans. And we must steward that well. Now we're all going to work that out differently. And and that's okay because God's word doesn't tell us there is one way to work it out. The church should be a place where someone who's passionate about ending climate change can worship alongside someone who's skeptical of the science. I'm not stating my perspective by putting science in quotes. Just putting it in their voice. Because both the advocate and the skeptic have higher allegiances and deeper convictions than how they feel about the environment as important as those things can be. But those higher and deeper convictions relate to Jesus, the state of our souls apart from him, what he's done on the cross to reconcile us to our Father. We're both saved by the same Jesus. We both find shelter in that same Jesus. We both embrace the forgiveness that Jesus secured for us on the cross. And we both look forward to the same new heavens and new earth when this bucking world ends. Or when the bucking of this world ends and the lion and the lamb are again at peace. All because of Jesus. Will you join me in prayer? Father, I know in a room like this, and if you include those listening in their living rooms, that there are a wide variety of thoughts and perspectives as it relates to the environment. Wherever each one of us is, I ask that you would cause your word to challenge us, push us, and grow us. Not ultimately for the sake of the world, but for the sake of your glory. For the sake of the nations knowing what kind of God we serve. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.